Welcome to Volunteer Canada's webinar on volunteer re-engagement. My name is Marissa Jalfusa. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a project consultant with Volunteer Canada, and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Deb Pike, who will be keeping us navigating smoothly in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, as uh, people are coming in, I'd like to invite you to um, communicate to us, let us know where you're coming from, your interest in the topic, and uh, anything else you'd like to uh, tell us. I'd like to uh, begin with a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are each on across the country. While we meet on a virtual platform, VC does this as a part of reaffirming our commitment to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people. Hello, hello to everybody. Very nice to see that uh, we've got some things coming into the chat. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to be introducing our special guests in a moment. As you can see, we've got uh, our special guests in the order that they will be presenting are Allison Stevens from Volunteer Canada. We've got Sammy Felchenfeld from Volunteer Toronto and Saskia Rinkoff from Harbourfront Centre, also in Toronto. But before we get started, just a couple of words about Volunteer Canada. Volunteer Canada was established to provide national leadership and expertise on volunteerism to enhance uh, participation and uh, quality and diversity of volunteer experiences. And since 1977, we've collaborated with institutions, governments, businesses, nonprofits, volunteer centers, and volunteers to broaden and enrich volunteerism in Canada. Okay. Today's webinar is, go, are going, is going to focus on three specific questions. Um, how are organizations dealing with changes in volunteer engagement? What are their strategies for engaging new and returning volunteers? And how have, have volunteer centers been affected by the changes in volunteer engagement? And how have they supported their communities through that? And we... Um, <laughs> And um, what uh, the format that we're proposing is, uh, rather than um, just uh, giving you a lot of uh, sort of book information, I guess we would call it, we uh, invited some people who have really, um, really good experience with uh, witnessing these changes and witnessing how other people have uh, done that. And so we're going to take a bit of a funnel approach. We're going to go from national observations to more specific volunteer center observations within their community. And then finally, to um, an organizational observations. Um, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A or you can put them in the chat. And uh, we're going to be taking some questions uh, at the end of the presentations. Okay, once again, our guests are Allison Stevens, uh, Specialist Volunteer Centers and Volunteer Engagement at Volunteer Canada, Sammy Felchenfeld, Manager of Training at Volunteer Toronto, and Saskia Rinkoff, Manager of Volunteer Engagement at Harbourfront Centre, also in Toronto. All right, so we're going to begin with Allison Stevens, a specialist uh, and my colleague, and also I'm sure uh, needs no introduction to so many of you. Okay, the, Allison, the floor is yours. Allison, uh, unmute, please. Thank you. The first thing I had to say is I'm on mute. Um, thank you, Marissa, and good afternoon to all of you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, so as you are all very well, everyone probably on this, uh, in this call, uh, the pandemic uh, that we've been living through has had an enormous impact on nonprofit organizations, including volunteer centers. 
they have obviously had to adapt, they and you, <laughs> have obviously had to adapt and face many challenges, including how to engage volunteers and to keep them engaged. Next slide, please. Um, to start with, um, I will give you a few stats and trends from a national perspective. According to the surveys sent out in the early months of the pandemic, a whopping 96% of organizations reported having closed completely or having suspended some or all of their programs. That's, that's a lot. 78% <laughs> had uh, managed the situation by transforming their activities to a virtual uh, format, which is not obviously uh, possible for all activities we know, but 78% of them had done that in the first few months. And more than 80% of volunteers who had chosen or had been obliged to stay at home expected to return to their volunteering as soon as they felt it would be safe to do so. That's, uh, yeah, and then there was, there was much uncertainty, as I'm sure you all remember, and one of the things that's interesting is that one of the big uncertainties during those first uh, six months would would there be a second wave? I mean, it's it's it does seem so far away for for us now to consider that, that people were worrying about that. I think we're in the sixth wave now. Um, so overall, the trends and challenges for nonprofits in the first year or so of COVID were a significant shift to virtual volunteering, as I mentioned. There were many fewer volunteers involved, partly due to fewer programs and more virtual volunteering, but also due to lockdown situation. There was much worry about the return of volunteers. Um, we were hearing it constantly on our calls with our members and with our uh, volunteer center members. Um, would the would the would they want to come back as time goes on? Now that we're going, you know, month after month after month, will people just uh, give up? Um, would those volunteers staying at home actually need volunteers services themselves? Would their roles have changed by the time they come back? And if so, would they have the interest and skills to do that job or that those tasks? Um, would they be prepared to do different tasks? And most importantly, how to remain in meaningful contact with those who chose to or had to stay away. We observed an increase in volunteering, which is essentially a good thing, right? I mean, Canadians responded generously to the emergency. However, as you also know, there were not enough positions for all the people who wanted to volunteer and organizations couldn't keep up with the demand, platforms crashed, it was kind of a crazy time. Um, and the other thing is that there was a sharp increase in informal volunteering, caremongering, if you will, informal neighborhood and community groups, Facebook groups. This has been and will continue to be a challenge for nonprofits. It's not an unwelcome challenge, but it's definitely a challenge. Okay, next slide. So over time, some of the new volunteers had to go back to work or school or had to take on added uh, family responsibilities. In other cases, the shine on virtual volunteering wore off. There was Zoom fatigue or you know online fatigue for sure. Um, many older volunteers continue to be reticent to return in person, although we hear this is slightly different in different provinces. An organization in BC found it relatively easy to find volunteers as long as meetings were virtual. But now these are resuming in person and they find they are short many hundreds of volunteers. According to a Charity Village survey carried out in 2021, a good quarter of organizations had rep reported having lost 75% or more of their volunteers over the previous year. So that's a huge amount of, it's a huge amount of change for the sector to deal with. And finally, um, yeah, so one of the biggest impacts is that there is a significant number of volunteers engaged. So now behind the, the numbers and statistics, next slide, we can make some general observations. Here are a few that I see as important. 
First, as I mentioned, there's been a serious reduction in the number of volunteers engaged, certainly with organizations, and as the pandemic fades in severity, there's likely to be a reduction also in informal volunteers. So questions are, are there ways to continue services and programs with fewer volunteers, or do we need to find new ways to both structure our programs and to reach people? Secondly, virtual volunteering is here to stay. Some programs might change back to in-person, but some will not, and some changes will be to a hybrid model. Take advantage of the strengths of both. We recently heard from some organizations who are continuing their orientation and training online, but their program is in person. There could be other forms of hybrid with evening and weekend activities being virtual and weekdays in person, or different streams of programs. It obviously depends on the type of program and who is involved. I recently saw an, um, a post on uh, LinkedIn for a webinar on hybrid volunteering programs. It's, it's going to be a thing, I'm sure. Thirdly, after enormous efforts and much creativity, COVID fatigue and burnout has definitely set in. There was a burst of activity, innovation and action amongst nonprofits and volunteer centers at the beginning of the emergency as they focused on finding ways to serve the population, often in increasing numbers and increased services, as well as engaging volunteers in effective ways. It was impressive and very successful. Two years on, the energy is flagging and mental health issues are rising among staff and volunteers, including those on boards of directors. And yet, the same level of creativity and focus is required. There's an obvious risk in this situation of losing staff and leadership along with their knowledge and expertise. Which leads me, in a way, to the last uh, observation, which is that there is a shortage of volunteer management expertise. Among the early victims of staff reductions were volunteer managers, and while we're seeing some hopeful signs of recovery in, their, uh, in those jobs, there's still some risk in that regard. How is recruitment being managed? How well are volunteers being screened and supported by, inexper by inexperienced volunteer managers or those who have taken on the role in addition to their regular workload? So that's a worry for sure, and uh, we're, we're looking for hopeful signs uh, over time. So to close, all is not uh, doom and gloom. Um, there are some hopeful signs. First, we know that nonprofit organizations and volunteer centers are resilient and resourceful. You'll be seeing some signs of that today. They have proved this over the past two years. Secondly, there definitely are new volunteers who have been inspired by this emergency, and we can hope that if their experience was positive and meaningful, at least some of them will continue to be engaged. And finally, a totally different uh, area, companies deprived of in-person group volunteering activities have had to rethink how they can contribute to their communities. While some have switched to skills-based and virtual activities, as we know, these are not always appropriate or available, and so more reflection has led to some interesting alternatives. But that's a topic that deserves a separate conversation. I just wanted to give you a few positive points after my doom and gloom statistics. Um, that's it for me. Uh, happy to answer any questions later. So, Marissa? Thanks, Alison. Thank you very much. Apologies for, can everybody hear me much better now? Apologies for the little sound uh, issues. Um, hopefully that's uh, much better now. Amazing. Thank you for your feedback in the chat. Really appreciate that. Okay, so um, our next guests are Sammy Felchenfeld uh, from Volunteer Toronto and Saskia Rinkoff from uh, Harbourfront, also in Toronto. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, so that we can see Sammy and Saskia. Okay. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Marissa. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sammy. I use he, him pronouns. Um, so if I'm from Volunteer Toronto, which has been mentioned many times, if you're not familiar with us, we're Canada's largest volunteer centre. Um, with nearly 50 years of experience connecting volunteers to the organizations that need them. I won't go into the rest of our spiel because that's basically what we are, what we do. Um, but a big part of my work um, and a lot of my colleagues is really getting to understand what's happening for organizations and for volunteers. 
Um, so in terms of, you know, what re-engagement looks like and what that sort of process is really taking shape as, um, it's basically, we've been seeing that, uh, we've been seeing that organizations are first and foremost just directly asking volunteers right up front um, what they're comfortable with. So are they comfortable in-person volunteering? What about their vaccination policies? What about mask wearing? Before even inviting them back. So instead of just saying, we have an in-person role, come and do it. They're trying to talk to their existing volunteers. And that was a big part of Volunteer Canada's data collection of how much are organizations talking to volunteers and volunteers talking to organizations. So this is sort of the next stage of that. So we've heard town halls, email forums, just general checking in as means to do that. One big thing we actually saw from a few organizations is clarifying the difference between virtual and remote. So when we talk about that, we say virtual is really, you know, sitting down at your computer and being on shift, whether you're on call, whether you're on a Zoom call in a group setting, um, or just a set time that you're expected to be there to respond to emails, whatever it might be, versus something that's remote. Um, so some organizations are defining remote separately as self-directed project support. So we have volunteers, for instance, um, we have a copywriting volunteer who will do uh, their volunteering on their own schedule, just they have a deadline. So whenever they're gonna do it, that's a remote role. Um, and so clarifying that distinction has been a key part of re-engagement for some organizations as well. Even though there might be virtual fatigue or Zoom fatigue, there might be folks interested in that more self-directed project support as well. We've also actually heard from an organization, well, a few that have been doing hybrid volunteering, so roles that are the same, both in-person and, and uh, remote or virtual, based on the work they do. But what's interesting from one, one organization we've seen um, is that recognition has proven a bit of a challenge. So uh, one has tried for National Volunteer Week. They did a recognition event that was both in-person and virtual, so people could attend virtually, get the same kind of benefit aside from being in the space based on comfort level, uh, it's a learning curve. Um, there's some additional components involved in you know, setting up a camera, having everything set up so that it can be hybrid. Um, but that's another component of, of that re-engagement, giving the volunteers the opportunity to do what's, what is the safest and most comfortable for them as well. What we've really seen a lot of those, that there's a bit of try everything and see what sticks approach um, for some organizations, especially those that have had to ramp up quite quickly. Um, a few have learned that the roles they had and the way they were structured before the pandemic just does not make sense in today's world. So one example is that there's some organizations that would rely on longer shifts, maybe four or more hours, and found that they're just not getting volunteers to, to want to come in for those that timing. And so by having shorter shifts and more frequent uh, offerings, so two hours is something we, we do for some of ours as well, has actually increased the interest and potential for volunteers. Uh, another example is an organization that, that discovered once they started having in-person roles again, that most of their in-person roles didn't need to be in-person after all. And they started shifting things, um, administration, fundraising support, even some of their event support purely to a fully virtual uh, component as well. And yes, some volunteers are tired of virtual volunteering. There's no way to get around that. But there are also a lot of volunteers who are really keen on being more flexible, which is something I'll talk to more later. For us at Volunteer Toronto, um, a big thing for us is really just trying to get a sense of what needs are out there for organizations. Um, we do our best to listen and we do our best to answer. Um, one of the things that we provide is uh, our learning library. I just shared the link in the chat for you. Um, and this is a place where we try to answer questions about things like vaccination policies, screening, PPE, all those types of things. Um, even just questions to ask for, for the shifting changes in returning to in-person or returning to the office as well. We don't have all the answers, but a lot of this is based on what we have heard from uh, people across the city and the region as well. And then for us as an organization ourselves, we have no in-person volunteers, um, and that's been the case since the pandemic started. So we've adapted all of our roles to virtual or remote, and we're also in the process of planning what in-person uh, things will look like, but trying to, just like I was saying, consider those health and safety concerns, the comfort of volunteers. So for example, we have a team of volunteer advisors. These are our volunteers who help people seeking volunteer roles, navigate our website, find out what they're looking for. And that always, almost exclusively was an in-person role before the pandemic. People would come into the office, set appointments. There would be phone calls and emails, but it was uh, the preference for a lot of folks was in person. We found that there is a ton of uptake for the virtual version of this. So we're trying to figure out the ways to partner with community organizations to have these in-person things take place within specific communities through local hubs uh, like libraries, as an example, or the YMCA, uh, places that already exist within communities communities where we don't have to carry as much of the, the uh, uncertainty about an in-person space and rely on other organizations who are also covering these 
addressing how they want to, to solve these problems. Another example I'll share just for, for us as Volunteer Toronto as well, we have ambassadors, which are volunteers that go out and do information sessions about volunteering. Uh, and before the pandemic, it was, again, purely in person. We switched them entirely to virtual sessions. And now we get double, triple, or even four times more people than we ever got for the in-person session. So our impact is actually greater. Um, but at the same time, it comes with people you know sitting through another zoom webinar so again we're looking at and talking to our volunteers and future volunteers about what does it look like to do these in person but continuing with the virtual component as well because of how successful it's been for us too so even for ourselves from a re-engagement standpoint we're trying to define that balance between what makes the most sense uh what makes the most sense for us uh to be able to to do our program the way we want to do our programs and services, um, but also take those as learnings to help organizations like yours uh, it, along the same lines too. Uh, and with that, I will throw over, over to Saskia. Thanks, thank you Sammy. Very much. <laughs> um, thank you, Sammy. So it's lovely to meet everyone this afternoon or where, maybe it's morning in some of the regions, wherever you are. Um, at Harborfront Center, I'm the manager of volunteer engagement at Harborfront Center. We are an arts and culture organization on the lake shore, and we occupy or manage a 10-acre campus um, that has a lot of outdoor and indoor venues that we use to present live events. Um, and of course, when the pandemic started, that was a big change and a shock for everyone because all the live events had to be canceled and the volunteers, the hundreds of volunteers who would be uh, engaged with any of those events were suddenly not, not able to come to our campus and participate and support the different activities. So it was a quick turning point for all of us to adjust to the no, new situation and make the best of it and it really started on an organizational level that they had to build up um, a new department basically the digital transformation team that was um, responsible for creating online programming. So much of the festivals that have been curated for on-site activities on the different stages had now to be recorded and, and uh, transferred into online programming. And that took some time. It took quite, quite a few months to find a routine and a process that would work for the whole team and for everyone involved to get that going. But it was amazing to see that we were able to offer music and dance and, and uh, performing arts pieces and visual arts pieces uh, in a virtual capacity. As for the volunteers, that was also a big change. And for me, the primary um, concern was to stay connected and keep the current team that we had on board involved and engaged. So it really started on a basic level with just making a lot of phone calls and reaching out with emails, through emails to ask them, how are you doing? How are you coping? What is your biggest need? And how can we best support you? I think by establishing this early connection and keeping the communication line open made a big difference in us maintaining this relationship and keeping them attached to the organization. Um, like everybody else, Zoom became a major tool to keep in touch with everyone. Um, so we started to introduce workshops and social opportunities for them and then slowly also introduced online virtual volunteer opportunities that they could access. Um, one of the pieces that I started with was really tapping into the team itself, looking at their skills and what they could offer to keep uh, the community going. 
we established an email and phone call system within our volunteer database so that uh, the volunteers could reach out to each other, offer support for each other, keep in touch and create that sense of community. Then I also looked at individual people who had skills like um, we had one, one volunteer in the team who is a textile artist and she offered to do an online workshop, a seven week long series on natural dyes that you could do at home. So how to prepare and dye your fabrics that you could find in and around your home. Um, so, and as it happened, it just was starting in the, sum, in the spring, summertime. So we had then weekly tasks for them. They could go out into the park, go for a walk, go into their backyards and collect certain flowers and, and, and uh, natural fibers that lent it themselves well for dyeing. So it was a great exercise and everybody had then that connection that they not only build with nature and being outdoors again, but also doing something in the safety and the comfort of their homes. And at the end, we shared all the, the projects that they individually had worked on at home. And we had a little showcase after the seven week series ended. We also started a book club that kept, that was then uh, supported by our literary department. Um, TIFA, the Toronto International Festival of Authors, their staff helped with the, the discussions and contributed some ideas around books that we could read as a group and have monthly conversations. And this is still happening. After two years, we are still meeting on a monthly basis and it's manageable. It's not overwhelming in terms of having to be on Zoom all the time. Um, one other project that we had worked on was a, a writing and illustration workshop for uh, people who were just interested in screenwriting or poetry. And again, we had one volunteer who had a degree from OCAD in illustration and creative writing, and she had agreed to host a seven week long series doing different exercises, teaching different writing uh, skills. And again, at the end, we shared all the stories and poems and, and uh, exercises that we had created and created a beautiful PDF that then could be shared among the group and had a showcase also show and tell. Um, in addition, with the digital transformation team, we were also able to introduce a new virtual role about proofreading and editing transcripts. So many of the videos that were produced, they sometimes had uh, like what we do today with a transcript that needed to be made available and and edited because sometimes these transcripts aren't totally accurate when they when you you see that when you see the subtitles they aren't always accurate so we had a team of volunteers who would take on these transcripts they had to watch the video and then compare the transcripts and make sure that all the text aligned and and um, were in agreement it's also a task that is still happening, not as frequently now that we are slowly transferring back into in-person opportunities as well. Um, we are actually starting with our summer and spring and summer season with in-person volunteer opportunities. And what's been amazing is because we stayed in touch with the current team, we were actually able to bring a fair number of people back into the fold from the get-go. Um, we haven't had as much of a struggle to find people who were feeling comfortable enough and safe enough to come down because we also had that reassurance that everybody is vaccinated and that we all adhere to a mask wearing mandate 
and I think that created some sense of safety and comfort for many. And others, that's totally fine. They are not ready yet to come, but they stay in touch with us through the newsletters that we are creating for volunteers, by volunteers, or they are able to offer and share their skills on online. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it on my end for the re-engagement part of the, the, the re-engagement portion of the volunteer team. Um, I think I was also pretty lucky, I must say, and very grateful that I could stay on, that I was not laid off or suspended mm -hmm. as a staff person. That the that the organization realized and appreciated the value uh, in keeping volunteers connected, and and now we reap the benefits of having them already on board. Excellent. Thank you very much, Saskia. Actually, in your um, echoing some of the things that Allison and Sammy were mentioning as well, uh, Sammy and Saskia. Um, so um, I'd like to, the next portion is we're going to talk about a project um, that was funded by the Starbucks Foundation on uh, volunteer re-engagement. Uh, it was initiated by Volunteer Canada, but the idea was to understand um, what were the challenges uh, that uh, nonprofit organizations were facing in the re-engagement of volunteers. And if we paired them with volunteer centers um, uh, to put, the, uh, put them together to sort of consult and develop a strategy, a very intentional strategy about not just restarting, but about not just restarting services, but re-engaging volunteers. And so um, we, uh, we had a very small group. We met uh, uh, in a community of practice and uh, Saskia and volunteer uh, uh, Harborfront Center or VACT, uh, which, uh, which Saskia will describe later. And Sammy, a volunteer Toronto, were paired together to uh, confront um, some re-engagement challenges that were faced by several um, several cultural organizations. Uh, Saskia and Sammy, would you like to go ahead? Sure thing. Sure. All right, Saskia, the slides are there, so you can you can kick us off here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Sammy. So as Marissa already mentioned, um, we have an, a committee that we organized in 2016 in Toronto called Volunteer Awards for Arts and Culture Toronto. And it consists of uh, the committee is representing about 12 to 16 organizations, depending on the year, that are active in the arts and culture sector in Toronto. So it includes like TIFF and Hot Dogs and Imaginative, the City of Toronto Cultural Events, uh, Harborfront Center, Luminado, Imaginated, uh, Real, A Real Asian Film Festival, Inside Out, Pride, Fringe, and others. Together, we really wanted to create a strong and vibrant arts and culture volunteer community, and um, so that we because we saw that there was such a strong overlap within the community. They were volunteering at multiple organizations, and we wanted to celebrate and recognize that. So every year on International Volunteer Day on December the 5th, we are organizing a, a special event, a celebration, and invite everyone who participated and supported three to four organizations every year. Uh, so we created the stamp system that we would give each volunteer who supported multiple organizations a stamp for each of the volunteer programs that they completed within a calendar year. And then they would come and attend the event. So of course, during the pandemic, that was greatly reduced, but we still hosted the event. We just invited everyone who was in this pool already and had 
uh, a celebration happening on December the 5th in 2020 as well as in 2021. And now we are all ready to come back. But in preparation of our new season for 2022 and 2023, we felt it would be a good idea to introduce some professional development opportunities. We had talked over the years uh, to, to create shared training modules because it's really challenging for all the volunteers to go through these different organizations and each time need to be retrained. And many of the trainings overlap to a certain degree. We share many of the same ideas and approaches and roles. So we felt it would be a good idea. And then when um, EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion became a hot topic during the pandemic, we felt that may be the right time to introduce a project around that, a training around that. So we reached out to Volunteer Toronto and uh, Sammy and Iona, who was still on board at the time, were eager to, per to collaborate with all of us. And so we started working on developing a training around human rights and equity. Um, at first, we thought we could just neatly package everything into one module, but it became too too much information in one session, and maybe Sammy will elaborate on that as well. So we focused on just the first part with uh, human rights and equity. And now we are in the process of launching that within our own organizations. We encourage all volunteers to access Volunteer Toronto's Learn VT platform to create an account and go through the training by themselves. It's a self-directed learning. But of course, stay in touch with the organizations if they have any questions and um, build that basic knowledge around inclusive, inclusivity and equity within the arts and culture sector in Toronto. Sammy, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump off of there. Um, we definitely learned, like Saskia said, that the, the content was um, a lot. This is the start of a project that was going to be other content areas, including LGBTQ 101 terms and uh, accessible customer service. But human rights and equity on its own kind of expanded, which is good because it sets us up for more modules later this year that are coming. Um, and then a key piece is also um, as sort of a, a connection point between the organizations. It, say someone is a volunteer of Saskia's at Harborfront and does this training and then goes on to Luminato to volunteer there, the system will record that this volunteer has already completed the training. So that was a big, big kind of plus as a, as a through line, which I'll talk a bit about um, a little bit more. But I do want to really quickly talk about Learn VT. Um, if it's the first you're hearing, hearing about, about it, it's uh, Volunteer Toronto's uh, home for self-directed online learning. Um, and uh, a big thank you to our friends at Volunteer NBC who basically helped build, build this with and for us um, in 2020 uh, and was launched in early 2021. Um, so conversations had already ha actually started before this project came to be with VAC last year um, to, to enable the use of this space for learning. So I'm going to really quickly share uh, LearnVT with you just on the screen here. Um, it's just learnvt.ca. It's pretty easy address if you want to check it out yourself. Um, so the way it's set up is that it's for all of our self-directed learning. We have topics on volunteer management and virtual volunteer management. We have a course specifically around uh, setting up, getting started as a sports leader. And then we have training for people interested in, in board roles. Um, the, the introduction to human rights and equity course, which I'm very briefly showing here, is not on our homepage yet because it's starting through the VACT network. Um, but it is a free course, whereas uh, most of our courses are paid courses at different uh, amounts. But the learning library I pointed you to before is also on LearnVT as a completely free course as well of all of our resources too. So the idea here behind this was that it, it's something that's that's scalable and it's a way for us to support uh, support the community and support organizations with our existing infrastructure. So LearnVT exists now. We keep solving problems that come up with it to try to make it better and better. Um, and we're hoping that it's also a model for future partnerships and extensions of, of what we're already doing. 
in this case, this is hosting another organization's training on our platform, and there may be other opportunities from there too. But the big question is, how do uh, how do does this support reengagement? Um, there's a few key areas, like Saskia mentioned right off the bat. Um, there is an interest in providing this topic and avoiding any of the overlap. So it's all about freeing up capacity for these organizations while providing training on this key topic, so that each of these many organizations don't need to keep basically providing the same training. All the volunteers come to one place. The training is still VAC, VAC wrote it, VAC edited. They were part of this process. Um, but another really big thing for, for uh, re-engagement that's a huge benefit of this is that if a volunteer comes to a, a festival or an arts and culture organization and has never heard of VACT before, but they go into this training and see VACT information everywhere, a description of who VACT is, a link to the VACT page, there's a hope that there might be interest in them getting involved with other arts, arts and culture organizations to work towards the recognition event, but also just to get more involved. And then on the other side, it is a, a, a unique benefit for volunteering with a VAC member organization. So it's beneficial as a recruitment tool for those future festivals lining up for this year to say, hey, here's a unique training. The full version will be available throughout the year. Um, volunteer with us this is something you get for free as well. So there's a bit of that angle too. I'm going to throw it back to Saskia for one more slide just to talk really quickly about collaboration. Yeah, I think that was uh, really important to us that we try to keep connected with each other and learn from each other and build on each other's experiences, especially during the pandemic, and would uh, increasingly start to collaborate. And that's maybe something that will come up in, in the discussion afterwards, too, in terms of sustainability. Um, uh, it was also a great way to develop new ideas and and working having the ability the opportunity to collaborate with not only um volunteer toronto but also with all our organizations associated with the arts and culture committee in addition to the individual resources that are available within our organizations. Many of us have very skilled uh, staff members and also volunteers associated with each of the teams. So we also try to tap into that pool of resources and give them opportunities to participate. Um, for instance, with the LearnVT uh, platform and with the design that you saw in one of the previous slides that shows the human rights and equity uh, learning tool, one of Harbor Front Center's volunteers happened to be a graphic designer and she developed the look for our new training, um, which is just incredible to have these resources at our fingertips. Um, and yeah, now we are excited that we have this first module in place and hopefully we'll be able to build on uh, future trainings that will also address other topics uh, such as uh, team leading and mentoring, building, building all these different professional development skills for volunteer communities in the city. Yeah, so it's, it's, it was a great opportunity to really um, use this project as a jumping off point to now what is going to be, what has already been a collaboration, but now is going to be a very fruitful ongoing collaboration piece too. And I'm seeing some interesting questions about LearnVT that we will answer uh, afterward um, very soon. But I do want to, uh, I do want to really quickly just wrap up with a few tips about collaboration. So Saskia and I have known each other for many years. That was a great starting point for, for just us personally, but also Volunteer Toronto has worked with many of the organizations with Impact. But really, collaboration starts with individuals. It's not your organization going to another organization and existing as organization entities. It's people to people. So it's building those relationships individually. Um, start with the people you already know. You're own networks and and ask for those warm connections so if i didn't know saskia maybe i know someone else in back or someone else in harbor front and say hey could you introduce me to this person um, look for partners that are doing both similar things but also wildly different things from you as long as they're both aligning with your mission one of our collaborators is pledges for change they are focused on volunteer engagement specifically for youth so that's very similar but a lot of the work they do is quite different from us and how they want to engage youth and it's an area that that they are strong in so we are going to just empower them to do that and then just as Saskia said, wrapping it up really quickly, um, look to your own volunteer pool for potential collaborators or potential supporters, just like the graphic design support we had um, as well. 
Um, I'll just um, just to take the opportunity to say uh, thank you. That was a lot of uh, very interesting, very good information. Um, I think that obviously this is a project that was done in a large urban center, but um, I think that the, the point is that collaboration can sometimes be a real key to sustainability and re-engagement. Uh, so I just want to take this time. We've come to the end, and I'm going to uh, quote uh, one of our participants in the chat and to uh, say we've certainly had a packed session. Thank you so much for the excellent work. Thank you to our guests, uh, Allison Stevens, Sammy Felchenfeld, and Saskia Rinkoff. Thank you, Deb, for your technical support and your general wisdom. Uh, I would like to thank you, thank you all for attending and uh, for the important work that you do and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much.